try to adjust, but uh, yeah. So Bismillah, let's go ahead and let's get started here. Inshallah, Jazakallah Khair for uh, coming on. I appreciate you all for joining us today uh, for the first session, Inshallah, of 10 for the Summer Sira series uh, with Muslim Space. So we uh, are calling this series the Prophet Sallallahu and I. And so we dive into today's session uh, with the outline that was kind of that was kind of given a very broad topic in terms of not just why to study the Sira, but also the importance of the prophetic example. What what society was the Prophet Sallallahu born into? Where where did uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi come? Uh, in, 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 in time, and why do we study the Sirah? So to begin, we live in a very complex world. We, at the moment, at the moment, I'm just talking about at the moment, we live in a very complex world. The world is really rife, as you can tell, with injustice, oppression, racism, militarism, materialism, all of these different things, and we've got it packaged in uh, the world we live in today. And there's so, there's so much that's going on there, but it's also balanced with so much good. So it's not that we're just living in a completely degraded place. We have so many places that are uh, spots of light and so many rays of hope that are there. But what can the Prophet Sallallahu example teach us? What can it relate us to today? And how can we relate to it today? So where do we see the connections? Where, when we look at the Sirah, and for those of us who maybe read a little bit about the prophet, if it was in the Sunday school classes we were in, or if it was in a biography that we read, where did we connect with the prophet? What was that like? Where do we, when we look at the example of the prophet, where do we take a look and see the migrants of our world? Where do we see the Palestinians in our world? Where do we see the Uyghurs in our world? Where do we see the oppressed? Where do we see the homeless? Where do we see the exploited? Where do we see the exploiters? So these are easy to identify just in the context of the Sira itself, but where do we relate our world to this? So looking to that, and where do you most importantly see yourself? When you read the Sira, is it just a story of somebody that came, uh, you know, 14 centuries ago and, you know, just happens to be a historical figure that you're told to revere? Do you see yourself in that figure? Do you see yourself on the margins? Do you see yourself anywhere there? So we have this need to center ourselves in narrative. And that's what is a little bit different approach from what we're taking with this series, rather than just going through 570 AD until 632 and just giving you a raw biography. Because you can, I can recommend you a number of books that will do a much better job than I can ever do uh, in that. But we need to center ourselves in that narrative. We need to make a connection with it. Otherwise, we kind of the, the invocation of the Prophet Sallam falls on deaf ears when he says that none of you will have faith until you love me more than you love your father, your mother, your children, and all of humanity. How do you get to that point with somebody you've never met? How do you get to that point with someone who you might just know some fast facts about? How do you get to that specific point? And in order to get to that point, we need to know who that person is, not just what they did. We need to know the humanity of that person. Uh, Qadi Iyad, a uh, Shafi jurist had said that, you know, the experts of the Sirah, the biography, are not the ones who, uh, you know, know all the dates, know all the facts, know all the little things about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, know all these little things, uh, the lineage and the names and the tribes and all that stuff. But the person who reads about the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you can see that in the next day, they have become a changed person. They internalize the effect of the Sirah. They internalize the effect of these, uh, these sacred words that are there. So my approach for this program, and shall our approach here, is not that of archaeology. It's not that to see what is what are what are what what is uh, kind of there, and what what is that telling us about? What is the structure? Uh, what is the name of this? What are the historical elements? We're looking at the anthropological side. We're we're going to be anthropologists, and we're going to look at the example of the Prophet ﷺ from not so much a space and time in history. But what his example, what his world, what his life says to us today, what it said to the time there, and how is it relevant? So keeping those connections active. I'll give you an example. In, uh, in Sahih Bukhari, uh, you have this, uh, you have a number of hadith that are all classified under different groupings and whatnot. I'll, there's one in this, uh, the abridged copy that you have here that so many people have, the local mosque might have it as well. But just to give you an example. I'm opening up right here, page 183, and tell you why it's important to keep things contextually relevant to our time. I'm going to read it right here. Chapter 49, 
sweeping, cleaning of the mosque and removing rags, dirt and sticks from it. So emphasizing why it's important to clean the mosque. Why is it important to, uh, you know, to take care of the mosque? And here's the hadith. Narrated Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, and a black man or a black woman used to clean or sweep the mosque that he or she, and then he or she died. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked about her or him, and he was told that she or he died. He said, why did you not inform me? Show me their grave. So they, he went to them and their grave and offered the funeral prayer. Now, this is categorized under why it's important to clean the mosque. You can see, as most other people can see, that it's clearly not just about that. There's, there's so much into it, especially for us in the time that we live in today. How does it, uh, how does it inform us in light of the civil rights movement? How does it inform us in light of BLM? How does it uh, inform us in light of the, uh, the conversation on racial injustice? Very traditional perspective has put that as, why is it important to clean the mosque? We see from our perspective here, how important it is and how important it was to the Prophet Sallallahu to uh, elevate those at the margins. And these are the kinds of lenses that we are going to look at and reinvigorate the uh, material of the Sirah that is already invigorated, but the ones that have been passed down to us and is kind of more like a point A, point B, point C, and trying to fill in those voids. So I mentioned the importance of the prophetic example that uh, the Quran says that indeed there is, been, there is certainly in the messenger of Allah an excellent example, a good example, an excellent pattern for anyone in whose hope is in Allah and the last day and who remembers Allah often. So the Prophet whole being, his existence is an example. His existence is that example that you use on a test when it's like, it's explaining a question. Here's, uh, here's an example of that. It's clarifying. You get life from this. And for us, it's more than just like, oh, this is how I pray. This is how I do this. This is how I do that. The Prophet ﷺ came and we have the biography that's a holistic life. Not just, hey, the Prophet ﷺ prayed this much. The Prophet ﷺ said these prayers, just these aspects. You have the aspect of the holistic person. So the example is not just one of, hey, this is how you pray, or this is how you read the Quran, or this is how you do that. The example is one of how do you live your life to the fullest authenticity, uh, and to the fullest connection with God and those around you. So how can we love someone, as I mentioned, who comes 14 centuries earlier, who more than the people who raise us, more than the people who gave birth to us, more than the people who become our friends? Chances are that we will need to know just more than what date they were born, what battles they fought in, who, uh, what their uh, basic like facts are, to, uh, to, to, to develop this relationship. We need to know their story. We need to know who they are. Otherwise, we can't find that connection and we may never find that connection. So as I mentioned, this is just a primer. This uh, series that we're doing is a primer. It's to help us approach and engage the sirah, which you can do in your own context as you do with different books, different movies, whatever it may be, different lectures, however you engage the sirah. This is not intended to be an over-detailed biography or a sira intensive or uh, just a, uh, a whole crash course on the Prophet Sallallahu This is to help us gauge how we take in the material that's been given to us and see it in the light of the world we live in today, the struggles that we live in today, the people that we are today. How does it emphasize there? So we're going to emphasize the humanistic, the emotional, the personable elements of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the story. We're going to look at the series, the, the sira through a lens of trauma. And we're going to appreciate how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam rose from the status of an orphan going through multiple losses and traumas to uh, the example for all of humanity. So a number of books and lectures, like I said, exist on the historical life with dates and events. And on the syllabus, there's a bibliography. You can take a look. I recommend Revelation. Um, it's like a textbook style. Uh, but any of those books you go through, you can find a point A to point B of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi that's not what we're trying to do here because uh, not that many of the stories or the dates or the facts or the figures or the names, uh, it's not that they don't have any significance, but do they help us get closer to the Prophet ﷺ? For some of us, they do. For some of us, they do. But for many of us, it just leaves a gap. It's like, okay, I know this, per I memorized these things about this person, but do I love them? And it's, it's a very genuine and very honest statement to say, no, I don't, because I don't know them. I don't know them like I know my parents, like I know my wife, like I know my spouse, anything like that. So we want to foster that, cultivate the seeds for that. So think about what makes you connect to those around you, those that you look up to. And when we think about the Prophet, what, uh, when, when we think about it, what, 
who was the Prophet Sallallahu to you? What, what are your descriptions? What would your descriptors be of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? You're welcome to drop them in the chat if you'd like, but just think to yourself, what, what would you think if I say to you, what, what comes to mind when you think about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And those are those points of connection. We start with those, but we also start to deconstruct and say, how much more is there to someone who is the example for all of humanity? So as I mentioned, the Hadith was saying that none of you will have faith. None of you are truly believing until you love me more than these people or more than all of humanity. So how do we get to this ideal? We don't need to, we need to not only discover not just what the seerah or the life of the Prophet is, but we need to see who the Prophet was. And in the example of the Prophet his struggle in his being, we have a example that despite the fact that we're separated by 14 centuries, we, we asked the question, how does our society, how does my spiritual struggle as a Muslim in the 21st century in America, wherever I am, uh, how does it relate to that in which the prophet was born and how he grew up? So how do the conversations and discourses that we have around topics of justice, oppression, economics, racial inequality, et cetera, how do they bear relevance in light of the sirah? What, what's, uh, wh where, where is the contemporary connection? And how does the spiritual and physical journey of the Prophet ﷺ through his life inform us as Muslims in our contemporary time? So the objective here is very simple. Regardless of our identity, regardless of our faith, our gender, our orientation, whatever our job is, our career is, whatever difference we have, wherever we come from uh, in the world, that we find a connection and resonance with Prophet And it's my hope that we are able to plant the seeds. It's not my hope that, you know, by the end of this, that you'll be like, hey, this is exactly all that I need. No, this is just a primer. This is being admitted as just a few seeds uh, for us to then start on that path to rediscover the Prophet for ourselves. Because each of us are in so many different contexts, so many different uh, places in society. We will connect to different elements of the Prophet But I hope that this effort is a way for us to connect to the Prophet in the, in the respective context. So with that being said, just a quick overview. This is probably one of the few times you'll get facts, figures, dates, things like that from me, because my priority is on the more humanistic element. But just so you get a context and, uh, and a setting um, for folks who may not be familiar, who may be familiar, it's just a refresher that the Prophet ﷺ was born in the 6th century. So in 570 AD is a commonly accepted date of birth for the Prophet ﷺ. He lived a life uh, of 62 to 63 years. So he lived a, a fairly long life for that time. And his prophethood, though, was not for the majority of his life. His prophethood was for just 23 years, having received his revelation at the age of 40. And in between that prophethood, about 12 years was spent in Mecca, his hometown, and 11 years was spent in Medina, where he left after persecution. But he remained in Medina, and he passed away in Medina, where his tomb and his mosque are up to this day. And he was born to a, uh, a noble lineage. He was born within the Quraysh tribe, so the Quraysh tribe, but into the Bani Hashim clan. So there's numerous clans with sub-tribes, or so that you might like to call it, within the Quraysh uh, that were uh, the ruling tribe of Mecca. Uh, and he was born to the Bani Hashim. Plan. That was that what if you want to know something about it or the one thing that lasts is that it was of a noble lineage. It was a noble lineage. And so he wasn't born uh, completely on the margins. He was born to a notable and good family in that sense. And so uh, we'll, we'll get to the context of Arabia and the tribes in a bit. But just knowing that his lineage was understood in that time in a society that valued lineage, in a society that valued uh, tribal identity and clan identity, he was, he was, he was born into a, in a, into a good space with that name. But he was orphaned multiple times. His father died before his birth. His mother died when he was six. His grandfather died when he was eight. So as he's passing along, uh, going along, his caregivers, each of them pass away after a short period. And finally, he comes under the care of his uncle, Who's, who's alive until 49 or 50. The prophet himself gets his own household by the time he's 25, uh, but he is under the care and protection of his uncle from for, uh, until he's about 50 or so. And so if I, as I go back to this, if I ask you, who was Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What would your descriptors be? Maybe you would say prophet. Maybe you'd say statesman. Maybe you'd say imam, leader, or the beloved of God, his title of Habibullah. These are names that are valid, but these are names that if we just keep the Prophet ﷺ just to these, these are names that imply distance. How about when we think of the Prophet 
we also, in addition to these names, we add first off human, it's human, it's fully human. It's emphasized in, in the Quran and it comes back very importantly when he passes away. He was human, but he was an orphan. He was a working class person. He was a father, he was a son, he was a husband, he was a shepherd, he was a cousin, he was a widower, he was a lover. He was a community member, a community activist, he was a community leader. What about the quality and characteristics? You might say he was noble, he was brave, he was a sadiq al-amin, he was the trustworthy, the truthful, but he was also an emotional person. He was a crier. He liked, he, not, not that he liked to cry, but he was very emotive. He, he would cry in a time where people would not associate that with being manly. He was quiet, he was reticent, he was isolationary at times, but he was playful, playful with people who were his spouses, playful with children. He was caring, but he was also disillusioned at things that didn't set right. And he was also at times needy. He was at times lonely. So when we think about how his personality and his being influenced, not just who he was, but who he became and also the people around him, we start to then draw those connections. If we just keep the Prophet ﷺ at bay, that he's the Prophet ﷺ, I have no relation or any connection. I can't even aspire to get to that level. That's not the point here. The point is that the Prophet ﷺ absolutely enjoys his own spiritual station. But there's a reason that the Prophet ﷺ was named as a perfect example, as a good example um, that we might relate, that we might see in these qualities. And this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but in these qualities, we also find respite. We find commonality. And so when we see the Prophet ﷺ in his context, the Prophet ﷺ, Muhammad at that time was a seemingly ordinary person before the prophethood. He was seemingly ordinary. He was a regular guy. And we, we, we start with the city first in order to then understand the child of that city. So we begin with the uh, founding of Mecca. And many people are familiar with the story of Hajar and Ismail um, as uh, you know, we, that, that they were uh, left into the desert or you know, exiled into the, into the desert where uh, they, they founded this, uh, the city that is now the holiest site in Islam. We'll get to that in a second, but just geography, just picturing this out in your mind that the uh, the valley that Mecca is located in is in Western Arabia. It's in the, the Hijaz area. It's a barren, very uh, dry and very hot and scorched and very just uh, unforgiving environment. For those of you who have visited, who have gone for Umrah, who have gone for Hajj, you can probably attest that it wasn't exactly an oasis. It was uh, a very harsh place to go, especially in the middle of the day. It, it, it gets to be unbearable. Um, and so there's extreme heat. It's fairly desolate. It's not a very appealing looking place. It's not a very beautiful or aesthetic place. So when they went there, they weren't exactly going on a vacation or to a resort. They were going to the opposite. So uh, there's very scarce rain. But when it does rain, because it's in a valley, it floods. And you can see pictures on Google when it's flooded in the modern times, people are performing circumambulation around the Kaaba swimming. So you can see how uh, the floods impact a valley area like this. But it was generally ininhabitable. There's a reason why they went there and there's nobody there. You know, it's ininhabitable at large part due to a lack of water access. So just picture this being the setting, just the absolute most barren part uh, of the world or among the types of the world that you, that you can see. And just thinking about now, this is going to be a center of, uh, a center of refuge, a center of beginning for a single mom and her child. And so this was a town that just in terms of its context, for us, it's a town of pilgrimage. We think of Mecca, we first think about Umrah, we think about Hajj, we think where the Prophet ﷺ was born. We think associations of pilgrimage. And it was born out of migration. It was born out of the sense of movement, out of the sense of not settling, out of sense of exile, sense of finding God in the wilderness. And it has that connotation for us today. Even if we might take a nice air conditioned flight across the ocean and enjoy it, we are still leaving our homes to go find uh, a spiritual deeper connection in a place that we traditionally might not uh, go to all that often. And so we look at that in the context of Hajar, in the context of Hagar and Ismail, the wife of uh, Ibrahim and the son of Ibrahim here. And so there's biblical and there's Islamic accounts on this, that uh, of the famous narrative of Hajar and Ismail being sent away by the uh, wife of the prophet Ibrahim to the desert. Uh, you know, Sarah uh, had her child uh, 
Isaac and out of jealousy, out of uh, whatever you may would like to call it, you know, competition, whatever it might be, uh, had, had sent away uh, Hajar and Ismail. Oftentimes people say that, oh, they chose to go there. Well, if you go and see what Mecca is like and uh, what it was like when there's nobody there, I don't think they would have chosen to go there. So being sent, being exiled, having to migrate, Think about that. You think of the images that we have in our time today of single parents or parents migrating with a child on their back, coming across the border or walking through forests and whatnot to try and find some respite. Think about Hajar and think about her son, that they're going into this valley that was called the Valley of Becca. And this is accounted for in, in not just the Quran or in the sense that the, the, of, the, of the generic story here, but you get specifics in the Bible. This is in Genesis, in which uh, the, 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 uh, the story is told. The story of Zamzam is also told. It's in the Bible as well. So this is a sacred story that doesn't just limit itself to the Islamic context. And so when we take a look at this environment, when we take a look at the factors in the wilderness, we see a single mother in the middle of a barren valley with an infant. Already, you know, we, we, we see how hard it is to control a child or to try and make a child stop crying in the middle of Target or a shopping plaza. How hard must it be in a, in a space where you only have one small, uh, you know, just canister of water or so, uh, or a sack of water, and even that runs out. What, what do you do with that? What, what can you do with that? And so she asks Ibrahim, as he walks away, he, he's, he's, he's kind of escorted them there. And as he walks away, that if this trial or if this journey was something ordained by Allah, and when he responds in the affirmative, she answers even more profoundly, having that faith and saying that certainly Allah will not cause them to be lost. So when you think about Mecca, when you think about Hajar, when you think about these people, this, this woman, this child, you think about the strength that it took to build a city like this, as the resilience that it required to plant growth in a city like this, it required a trust in God. And that trust came from no one else other than, uh, other than Hajar in that moment. And Ibrahim had to uh, endure that, had to endure, I'm leaving my family there. And he, he makes invocations that are in the Quran, asking uh, for Allah to protect that family, to make it a prosperous uh, city that people will come to Islam, will come to find their connection to Allah. And let us resist the urge to water the narrative down for lack of, not, no pun intended, but let us resist the urge to water the narrative down because oftentimes it's pitched to us that, oh, you know, uh, Hajar and Ismail migrated or were taken to uh, the Valley of Mecca. Uh, you know, she set him down near a tree or just something and uh, he's trying to find water. She's just running back and forth between hills trying to find it. And oh, hey, all of a sudden he kicks something and there, here comes some water or, you know, the angel shows her where, where water is. Uh, oftentimes that reduces the significance of the sacrifice. If you go into Mecca and you get a little bit outside of where the city is developed and you go, just imagine yourself running between some of these mountains that haven't been torn down because the mountains that are currently in the present where uh, Hajar was running have been reduced due to erosion or uh, various different reasons. But you get an idea that in this heat, in the middle of the day, Hajar is running. She's a mother. She's running. And out of the scarcity uh, of water, out of the survival of her child, she feels that her child is going to die. She is literally running for survival. And there are the cries of an infant that is crying in the desert. There's nobody for miles. And there's an abandonment of a father. Call it what you want. The father was absent. So whatever you'd like to uh, term it as, if it's divine intervention, if it's there, the fact of the matter is there was no father at that, at that moment. Uh, there's no support. So think about the connection to Hajar and how many women and children are maybe, maybe at the border, maybe even in this country who have been abandoned, who are just trying to find a means to survive. They might be your neighbor. They might be somebody you see on the news. But this isn't just a narrative that happened in a long time ago. So think about the context of that. We think about then, uh, as we just kind of uh, brush through this, uh, the sense of the founding of Mecca, that how Ibrahim returns to this valley. He returns from Canaan, the land of Canaan, to help, uh, to help his uh, exiled wife and child in helping to build this, uh, this house of God that we have the Kaaba today. Uh, which used to be actually a rectangle. It's now a cube, but building on precincts that are actually rectangular. Um, you have the well of Zamzam that was there. And so you have people coming by now because there's spring, there's water, there's people that came by before Ibrahim had come back uh, and settled the area. So they, they start to settle around the water in this barren area. And so this is also, as I mentioned, acknowledged in the Bible. But there's the establishment of the pilgrimage. There's the settling in Mecca with Ishmael, that uh, with uh, Ismail, that he settles with uh, a 
um, a lady from the tribe of Jurham, so a, a tribe that is passing by, they marry and they settle that area, and especially with you have water now, so you have a reason to, to settle down in that area. Um, so it's not just a Muslim thing. This is a prominent part and parcel of the tradition and as well as the rituals of pre-Islam. So this isn't an Islamic story exclusively. This was a story that was known and uh, internalized by the people who hadn't even accepted Islam, who may have been polytheists, who may have been the people in Jahiliya. They were running the, uh, the, the, the Sahih as well. They were doing the runs between Safa and Marwa in honor of Hajar. So these, this is not an exclusively Islamic tradition. And so when we look at the Mecca, when we look at Mecca, that how Mecca was born from migration and travel. The meaning of Hajar has a connotation of someone who is traveling, someone who is migrating. And so what significance, as I mentioned, does that have for us today? So anytime I'm, I'm mentioning some of these things, related, this is intentionally done to relating to what do we see in our time today. After Ismail, as I mentioned, um, Ismail you know, being a prophet as well himself, uh, after he passed and some centuries passed, that religion began to be altered. So the original religion of monotheism, of uh, the Hanifism, if you'd like to call it, this, this uh, original Islam, whatever you want to call it, um, this monotheism began to be altered. But in this story, in this first part of our, our discussion here today, you have key figures, and I'll name out key figures at each discussion point that we have. But first and foremost, Hajar. You have Hajar who was an Egyptian, so an African who uh, some scholars say that she was the daughter of the, uh, the, the, the pharaoh or the vizier or the Aziz that was there, but most likely a freed slave, most likely a slave who was given as a gift. So she becomes a, uh, a, a freed slave, but she's at the margins, not just at that time. She's at the margins when she's in this household, because at that time, Ibrahim, Abraham was married to Sarah or Sarah, and she's already on the margins. And even more than that, she becomes marginalized when uh, she not only has a child, but uh, the other co-wife has a child as well. And she's forced to uh, being kicked out of the house. She's forced to be exiled. And so she's a single mom in that desert. She's a single mom. She's orphaned in a sense. She's orphaned with Ismail, who also in that moment becomes orphaned. Who knows what would have happened if that water had not come, if that respite from God had not come. But at that time, you still see, regardless of it, she had trust in Allah. She had belief when her husband left them behind that God will not let us perish. She had that belief, and then she put it to action when she started to run for the survival of her child. She started to look. So that she, imper she personifies struggle, sacrifice, as well as when you are at the margins and at the peripheries of society as a woman, as someone who is slaved, someone who has uh, children, and someone who's literally in the middle of the desert with no uh, cell service or anything that you can do to get in touch with anybody. So um, she's, she's in that context there. And Ismail is named as such because uh, his, his name means the one who hears Allah. So the story of Ismail and the naming of Ismail is actually a beautiful biblical tradition within Genesis, uh, as the Bible talks about that, uh, you know, Hajar had ran away from home and she was pregnant with this child uh, because she was just feeling that she was already being pushed out and, and not welcome. Uh, and uh, the prophecy is made of how Ismail will grow up to be a great person, but that to name this child Ismail because Allah heard the complaints and heard the cries and the tears of Hajar. So it's a beautiful name that tells how connected this mom and this child were to the divine and how much attention that was there. And for Ibrahim, there's as much that can be said, uh, it can be said that Ibrahim can't seem to catch a break uh, when it comes to the tests and trials uh, that are put forth by Allah in the sense that time and time again, he's having to sacrifice members of his family. He's having to put forth these sacrifices uh, that are uh, that are causing him a lot of distress. You know, he prayed for them, but at the end of the day, he's putting them at the mercy of Allah. So you're seeing this aspect of faithfulness, but also reconciliation, peace, trust that comes in this process. So Ibrahim's really the one uh, in this case on one end who, who's being tested on one side, whereas his other family members are being tested on another side. But uh, you see how his doubted self is being replaced with trust, that he's, he's replacing those emotions there. But still, you see that how, uh, how, how strenuous of a situation this can be, especially for Hajar and Ismail. So going now into pre-Islamic Arabia, and I just want to remind that we, we will do a discussion session, inshallah, around uh, seven o'clock. So I hope that this lecture goes for just uh, 
till seven and inshallah each time just for an hour 30 minutes or so we'll leave for discussion anything that we don't finish we'll continue in the next session but uh if you have any questions or anything that you'd like to mention just save it till that session there but um the pre-islamic arabia we get to uh, i'm not going to go specifically into like how which tribe went where who came out all that tribal stuff you can find that in abundance in much better resources than i can provide but what i want to tackle right now is the pre-islamic arabia the jahiliya uh the the name that we've oftentimes been told that this is what the prophet came and undid this is what the prophet came this was the the opposite to what the prophet came uh and it came and fixed and so we're often given a very simplistic brush stroke that jahiliya everybody was just savage they were uncivilized they had no idea what was going on everybody's running in the street naked they don't know what to do they're killing their daughters they're doing all stuff completely uncivilized folks. So of course a prophet's gonna come. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, so oftentimes, like I said, we're given this extreme dichotomy of how uncivilized or backwards or brutish the people in the society of pre-Islam was. And it's partially justified, some of it is there, but these nomers such as uh, being pagan or jahil or ignorant and savage, uncivilized, it doesn't do that culture, that society much justice. Jahiliya is not a just an age or a period of time that was there and has not come back. It's a state of mind and a state of being and consciousness by the testimony of the Prophet ﷺ himself, in which he said that there will be four traits of Jahiliya or, or, or of the days of ignorance, ignorance that will always remain in my ummah. One, boasting about one's ancestors' deeds and virtues. Two, defaming others on the basis of their lineage, saying that you're not as good as me, you're not you know, born into the same tribe or whatnot, this tribal and mentality. Two, seeking to be, uh, seeking these superstitions. So he specifically mentioned being given rain by the means of stars, but referring to superstitious uh, beliefs. And then also a overt ritualistic mourning over the dead. And so we see this in that uh, society of where people will just go all out and, and, and stop with their lives when someone has passed away uh, for, for time on end. And so he mentioned that these are traits that will persist. So if these traits will persist, Jahiliya in itself also in some state, form or shape persists as well. So we have this, uh, this idea that Jahiliya is not just people who are backwards or uncultured or uncivilized. We see a reference to Jahiliya more so as being quick to anger, being people of no balance, being people who are quick to do something or reactive and not being, uh, not seeing the limits of something, not seeing boundaries, not respecting boundaries. A uh, account is related in the book, uh, Ethical Religious Concepts in the Quran by uh, Toshihiko Izutsu that shows that there's a mentality of this YOLO. There's not a belief in the afterlife. There's not a belief in the sense of accountability. So people will just live their life as they can. And so given that they've only have a certain amount of years to live, they will live it to the extreme. But not to say that this is only that they don't have any values, because these were done within a set of values. These people had values. They had uh, a set of norms and ethics. But by the time it got to the prophet's time, you see how these uh, boundaries and these uh, ethics started to collapse and thus necessitating a need for a drastic change. So it uh, don't let it be assumed that pre-Islamic Arabia was just a backwards you know, just jungle that nobody had any idea of how to act properly. It was a rich society. It was a rich society culturally and in civilization. They had connections to the empires that were around them. They have, uh, you can see mention of the trade of certain Arabic items such as myrrh and such as frankincense being traded in the Bible and in other uh, spaces. You have societies and civilizations like the Nabataeans that uh, built Petra. So you see Petra, that marvel, you have a bit of that in uh, northern Saudi Arabia at the present, northern Arabian peninsula in Madain Saleh. You have a rich culture that is uh, grounded in a rich language of poetry. Uh, it has that complexity of Arabic, but also you see festivals. You see people coming by and doing different things in terms of their uh, arts and whatnot. So you have a rich uh, cosmopolitan area that might be in the middle of the desert, but it's by all means, by no means is it just completely uncultured backwater area. And it's located just outside the, uh, in, in between actually the Persian, Byzantine, and Abyssinian empires. So you have the Abyssinians at the Horn of Africa, you have the Persians up in modern day Iran, and you have the Byzantines up in the Levant or Sham or Syria uh, and above. And so you're surrounded here and you, you we have so many documented incidents in the life of the prophet and outside that show the rich trade that is being conducted. These people had a contact 
with society. And so what was their values? They had a strong value on tribal ethic, on loyalty, on chivalry, on forbearance, this aspect of hilm, of forbearance, of patience, uh, but also of social welfare, social welfare of tribal people, especially, and people who are on the margins, of justice, but of retribution. But these were in extremes. These were not in the ideal sense that we think of them now. And so Islam didn't come to completely contrast with these. Islam came to help optimize some of these, that they were already on some kind of spectrum of justice. They had an understanding of what it was like to keep the ties of kinship. So you see in the Quran, when things are listed, it's not, 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 not often on the, are these good things just negated. They are saying uh, they're meeting people where they are, but encouraging them to be better. We see though in the treatment of women that you have uh, not just rare, if any property rights, but a, uh, a, a complete, uh, disregard for uh, women's rights to divorce, women's rights to uh, you know, be married to the person that they choose, and also uh, with regards to a limit on wives. One interesting thing is oftentimes it's told that the Prophet ﷺ came and the, one of the biggest things that was happening is everybody's burying female infants. And this was characteristic of that society. They're just burying female, female uh, infants. And so the Prophet ﷺ came and this was a defining mark that he put an end to. However, if you look at the story, if you look at why people, certain tribes, not everybody, if everybody's burying their female infants, that society is not going to go very long uh, into the future. So uh, just thinking from a practical sense that certain tribes were actually burying their female daughters. Why were they burying them? There was, an, there was uh, instances of certain tribes raiding other tribes, taking their females. There was other tribes uh, that these were on the margins that out of economic scarcity, felt the need that they should bury their daughter rather than keep them alive, one, as a mouth to feed, two, as someone that would just be stolen or taken away anyways. Uh, and so we think about, was it bad people? Or were they also a combination from products of bad systems? Was there a system in place that enabled this? Because not everybody was burying their daughters. Some tribes were doing well off. They were, they were getting daughters and they were marrying them and uh, bringing them to adulthood. But certain tribes felt that they had to bury their daughters for honor, for different reasons that were warped, but out of a product of a system. So when we think of the Prophet we don't just think of isolated incidents or, hey, this is wrong. And so the Prophet came to correct that wrong. We look at it in the sense of a system because that's what the Prophet was. He worked both on the individual level, but also systemically. So we look at the economics. It's a highly stratified, immense disparity abroad. Um, you have in income inequality that's been exacerbated since the Prophet birth. And you have no specific rights or protections for women, for orphans, for widows, for slaves. So people on the margins are really at the margins and are discriminated against, but also just institutionalized, they're at the periphery. There might be a lot of uh, connections you might be hearing to that in our society today. We might not have those same, uh, those same kind of uh, categories at the moment, but you look at people who are, uh, uh, who are incarcerated, they come back they don't have, to, uh, you know, if they have a felony, they don't have the right to vote. You see all these different things that people are marginalized in different ways. Homeless people, orphans, all these different things, uh, they're still relevant to us today. And so we see, uh, we get a little bit of an insight into how this, this place was operating uh, a little bit later on when uh, Jafar, the cousin of the Prophet ﷺ, talks about uh, in his migration to the king of Abyssinia when they're seeking refuge. He talks about how uh, this society had plunged into the depth of ignorance and barbarism, that they uh, lived in unchastity, they had disregarded every feeling of humanity. And we'll get to this in specific. We'll share that hadith uh, as we get to that session. But this just gives you an idea that it, these, the Arabs of that time had high values, but they had clearly descended and clearly gone into that extreme. So this jahiliya wasn't just, hey, everybody before Islam was just all this, but there was this aspect of a waning and very uh, dwindling aspect of morality that was there. So what was the religion like? The religion was much more complex than just polytheism. What are, what are idols? We think about our time today. What are our idols? What are the things that we worship? What are the things that we get most worried about? And think about not just the stone things that were the idols of these people, but what became the idols of these people? We lifted up some of the things of tribalism, of lineage. What are, what are some of their idols? Money. Because you see the presence of minorities in this in this region, you see the presence of people who are monotheists, you see the presence of people who are Christians, you see the presence of people who are Jews, Zoroastrians, um, but you have uh, an aspect where uh, religion became a moneymaker. Religion 
was exploited. The house of Allah, the Kaaba, was made a pilgrimage center and people were exploited. It became the main means of economy for people. So naturally, when people exploit that, they exploit people who are around. And so wealth inequality was expanded and systems of oppression and, and oppression were maintained and structuralized. And so structural inequity sustained. So you see religion being used as a way to build a strata of society and keep people at the bottom. And you have this competition that fueled this this competition of other Kaabas or sanctuaries or other harams that were in places such as Sana'a in Yemen. So you have uh, the Christian shrine or the three cathedral, whatever you'd like to call it in Yemen, that was also a competition. And that leads us to a very interesting story that comes out with regards to uh, this, this other shrine that was there being desecrated by uh, an, an, an Arab and how that led to uh, a attack on the Kaaba by these Yemenis, by these people who are Abyssinian. Um, and there's a Quranic surah about this, there's a Quranic chapter about this, uh, the chapter of the elephant. And so it's a famous story with regards to uh, the uh, army coming to destroy the Kaaba in retribution. But also you think about not just the fact that, hey, they desecrated, but hey, this is competition. You know, Mecca is a money making space. So I'm not just sending an army out there just for the fact that, hey, this guy defecated in our in our sanctuary and we're just going to send our entire army into the desert. Uh, there's much more to it. It's like, hey, we do that, but we also wipe out some competition. So we get added benefit that's there. Um, and it's in this year. Spoiler alert, that story uh, has the, uh, that army was actually by miracle, uh, uh, you know, driven away or destroyed uh, by the, uh, by some divinely sent birds uh, that, that came from the sky and, uh, you know, plundered that, that, that uh, army with stones. And the account, as I said, is in the Quran and Surah Al-Fil, the chapter of the elephant. And you can read about it there, but it's in that context. In this world that's not in a vacuum by any means, in this really rapidly changing world that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is born. And his grandfather, uh, his father, though in that same year passed away, so he's born an orphan. And it's also uh, in the year that his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, became even more famous because he uh, was seen the one as who helped avert this disaster of the Kaaba being plundered and everything. But he's also of fame because he's reported to have rediscovered that well, that Zamzam well that Ismail and Hajar had found. Uh, and he's reported to have rediscovered that. Uh, but we see in that uh, how, you know, how this, uh, how beyond Ismail and up till the time of the Prophet what had caused the idol worship? What had caused the uh, people leaving the religion that was originally one and seeking out other means? And you sometimes think of scarcity. You sometimes think of uh, where was, where'd their water go because that, that well had gotten covered up, um, but also other wells had emerged. So people had ample wells now. So you're thinking, was it uh, a bounty that there's just so much now? Hey, we're just going to worship with a lot of different things. But you see the value system start to corrupt and you, you can think about what had caused this. So as we're kind of moving on now. We go into the childhood and the upbringing in the process. Of so as I mentioned, his parents, he was his, his dad was the son of Abdul Muttalib, who was the chief of the Banu Hashim. He was the chief of the Quraysh as well. So he's a very esteemed uh, person there. Uh, so his dad comes from a very noble lineage. His mother comes from another town in Yathir, Medina, where he will go and live for, uh, for his final 11 years in his, prophet, in his prophethood. But what's most important here is we oftentimes just say the prophet was born as an orphan and he uh, lived uh, with his mother and then she passed away and then he's just kind of moving along hands. We don't think about the developmental trauma that the Prophet ﷺ was experiencing. There's a, a book here that's called uh, the, the Body Keeps the Score. Uh, I have the, bibli uh, the I have it referenced in the bibliography, so you can definitely check it out there. But this is a quote from that book. The capacity to bounce back from adversity, develop resilience as a child, subjects, referring to a study that was conducted, subjects coped with life's inevitable disappointments and adversities because of the security established with the primary caregiver during the first two years of life. The resilience in adulthood could be predicted by how lovable uh, mothers maybe rated their kids at age two. So there's think about just keep that in mind keep that in mind that primary caregiver establishing security within two years of life helping them bounce back from adversity just keep that we're going to come back to that because we're going to see it in the life of the prophet going forward but we see also that's coupled with uh how the, how the book talks about equine therapy talks about uh 
uh, treatment with animals as a way of coping with trauma, as a way to heal trauma. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, after he came of age, became, become a became a shepherd, became a shepherd before he became someone who was trained in caravan, taking care of sheep. And we're, we'll talk about that in a second. But he was under the care of Amina, uh, his, his mother, is said he was up till six years old, but it was really about two years because he, she entrusted him to the care of some nomads and some Bedouins. Uh, as was the custom of the time, people would send their children to the desert. Think of it like an uh, Arab summer camp of sorts. It's kind of a little bit more extreme, but you have a summer camp where you uh, learn the ways of the Bedouin. Their, their language was pure. The way they, I, they resonated with nature, the way that they developed, they learned skills and all these things. This was a good thing to go about. So there's a, a significance that you see when the process of lifts up things of nature, lifts up things of uh, solitude, lifts up things of how, uh, how, you know, how important it is to be connected with the world around you and the environment. Where does this come from? This comes from a very essential part of his childhood. Uh, and the people who, was, who were entrusted with the uh, Prophet Sallallahu were Halima, who was a Bedouin, and her husband. They took the board reluctantly because he's an orphan. So already his society is like, he's, he's an orphan. He doesn't have a dad. Okay, he has noble lineage, but he's still an orphan. You know, this is, this is the bread and butter of the society. What makes you run is, who's your dad? And when you don't have a dad, you're in a little bit of hot water. So not just taking that, but this looking at where Halima and her husband are from. They're Bedouins themselves. They're literally at the margins, and they are marginalizing the one who's also at the margins. But they raised the Prophet ﷺ. They raised the Prophet ﷺ with love and with uh, kindredness, and they uh, regularly took him back to see his mother. But uh, his mother, Amina, stayed apart from the Prophet ﷺ for about three to four years until she brought him back. So that number, keep that number in mind. Two years now she'll get with the Prophet ﷺ. And we, uh, we have... Um, how the process of, as we mentioned here, resilience in adulthood could be predicted by how lovable mothers rated their kids at two. The, uh, the Bedouins, Halima and her husband brought the prophet back because there is a incident related of uh, a miraculous splitting open of his chest and the chest being cleansed by uh, two angelic figures and removing a black clot and cleaning his chest and putting it back. Uh, but they were kind of shook by this. Well, however you'd like to read that story, they were shook by this and they're like, okay, we got to take him back because who knows what's happening here. This kid's, uh, you know, has some supernatural stuff going on. Took him to Amina, his, 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 his uh, mom, who, is, who says like, I know he's a special child and she knows. So she knows that uh, she already rates this child at age two and she knows how lovable he is. She knows how special he is. And so she takes it in, in stride in a sense. She's like, it's okay, he's with me. But as she takes him in, she wants to get him connected to other members of the family because his father has passed away. She has family in Medina, in Yathrib, where he is to go later on to meet her family. And But on the return uh, from that, from the time they spent with the family, he, his mother passed away. His mother passed away just shortly, just uh, uh, outside of the town uh, of Yathrib in a town called Abwa. And she passed away and... Her passing was so significant that not only was he overcome with emotion and crying at that moment, it's a six-year-old child, what, what else would you expect? Crying at that moment, but almost 50 years later, coming back to that same spot in the middle of the desert, in the middle of the night, taking a detour, stopping, dropping on his knees and beginning to cry. And the people around him are like, why are you crying? He's like, this is where my mother is, born, where my mother is buried. And so you see how connected he was from that moment that he didn't forget. He was weeping to where he was taken away from that moment, but he lost his mom. He lost his mom. And so the Prophet was someone who experienced loss and who showed it. He didn't just, he's not just somebody who's black and white on a book and just like, oh, he lost his mom. All right, cool. He moved on to the next person. No, he, there's trauma there. There's loss there. Uh, and losing both his parents by age six, we can't, many of us can't imagine what that's like. But we see that he was accompanied by an Abyssinian servant girl of uh, Abdul Muttalib, of his grandfather whose name is Baraka. She'd later be named Umme Ayman after she has a child, but she returned him to his grandfather, uh, but she helped him raise him. And just keep in mind this, we oftentimes will say, Islam is not a racist religion. Islam has Bilal. Bilal was the one who gave the Adhan. Uh, so, and he was black. So Islam can't be uh, racist or whatnot. We don't think about Umme Ayman who was Abyssinian. She was also black. And she's someone who the Prophet ﷺ had termed as the mother after my mother. And when he would go visit her, she, he would call her my mother. He would say, mother, ya ummi. He would, he would refer to her and give her that respect. But she's just maybe six or eight years old at this time. She, she's not that much older than he is. She's, she's just a little bit older. And so she, at this, at this young age, takes him back to, across the desert 
to his grandfather. And he was under the care for his grandfather for how many years? Two years. And after the death of Abdul Muttalib, he was then entrusted to his uh, father's brother. So his paternal uncle, Abu Talib, who, uh, who took him under his care. But real importantly, take into mind the quote from that book, the capacity to bounce back from adversity, develop resilience, subjects cope with life's inevitable disappointments because of the security established with the primary caregiver during the first two years of life. So you have the first two years as if he's being given a new life in each sense, he's being started off. He's given two, at least two quality years. So you're trying to think, how is this child not just become some vagabond or some person that's just gonna go and uh, just go rage and lose all control. He has no parents, he's losing his grandfather. He's losing all this. He's going through multiple types of loss. How is he even just staying put? And you see, what time that what indication that gives us of the time that he was spending the care that he was getting was substantive it was enough to give him life to continue on while keeping these traumas at bay and so we see in this uh in this in the sense that uh when the prophet sallam was given over to abu talib or ch tasked uh, he was tasked with taking care of him this isn't something people would look forward to it's not like the prophet sallam was like the child of a king or like noble lineage like hey we do want to have him thinking about the context. He's another mouth to free. He's another mouth to feed. He's, uh, you think about the economics. You think about the fact that Abu Talib, the person taking him in, already has other kids. He's already got a house. He already has a wife. He has other kids. Um, how is he going to support this child? So you think about the personality that goes behind this, that uh, you know, the Prophet wasn't just transferring home to home, but he was also becoming a burden on other people. And they, they experienced distress because of that. But how did he navigate through that? So just to highlight some of these key figures, we mentioned Halima. Halima, the marginalized Bedouin, the nomad who made a living by taking care and nursing children of Mecca's elite. Um, and how we'll come back to her story towards the end of the Sirah. Because 55 years later, you talk about how the Prophet them, when he spends time with people, any amount of time, he remembers them. After almost 50 years, he remembers Halima and he encounters her uh, and, and they have a reunion there. So we'll get to that. But you talk about Amina, the Prophet's mom, that she's a widow. She's a single mom. It seems to be something that's recurring in this biography that Hajar was a single mom. Amina uh, is a single mom, a widow. She's away from her family in, in Yathrib. It's a, you know, just a, away from Mecca. She's economically disadvantaged. She doesn't have employment. She's primarily sustained through the lineage that Muhammad has through uh, his father and the clan of his father, the Banu Hashim. And so there's this concept of social welfare that this relationship shows us. And then we see in Barakah, we see in Umm Ayman, the Abyssinian slave who was in the house of his grandfather, who's, a, who's on the margins. She's a child working. We don't know where her family is, uh, bringing back Muhammad single-handedly from Abwa, going, uh, raising the prophet, not just bringing him back, but raising him and rising to such heights that the prophet would go on to call her not just his mother, but a woman of Jannah. He, and she goes on to serve in the battlefield. She goes on to be someone who's on the front lines when the Islamic uh, empire is uh, expanding, when the Muslims are fighting battles. Um, and she's someone who becomes not just visited by the prophet out of respect, but the, the khulafa, the khalifas and the caliphs that come after the prophet, they know she's someone of respect. They give her that respect as well. But where did she start and where did she finish at, in that sense? And we look at no, no later than the Prophet Sallallahu a triple orphan thinking about that impact that this has not just psychologically, but sociologically. He becomes an outcast. Like I said, you know, you have kids that uh, will treat other kids unfairly. They might still play with them, but they'll call them names. Just imagine the names he was probably called when he was said, you're not, you don't have a father. You don't have a mother. You don't have this. Your grandfather's dead. Who, you know, you're an orphan. Imagine how much more that stings in a society where that is literally your bread and butter. It's like if you go to a school and someone will uh, will insult your income and so be like, oh, your parents are poor. They're, they're, they're doing this in an affluent uh, neighborhood. That might be very uh, hurtful for someone who's on the margins. And just thinking about for someone that uh, is living in a tribal society based on lineage, based on fatherhood, based on this connection, if he doesn't have that in three regards, how much more peripherized is he going to get? And so you see developmental trauma. It starts to develop, but uh, just imagine watching your mom die. Not just that, imagine watching your grandfather die. Not just that, now you're going to your uncle, who is also has other mouths to feed, so you're already maybe not given the ultimate priority, but you're 
uh, you see that by the time he was six, sorry, by the time he was eight years old, he had already experienced fatherlessness. He had already experienced poverty. He had already experienced solitude. He had already experienced the death of his mom and his grandpa. And you see Abdul Muttalib. You see the grandfather, the family relative. You see him, uh, that those two years that he had, what he could have done or what he may have done to help his grandson get through that. And you see Abu Talib, his uncle, his father's brother, who's already married, has multiple children, uh, but he's not super wealthy, but he takes Muhammad in. He takes Muhammad and puts him to work, not out of any obligation, but we think about when we take in children, for those uh, in our community who foster children, who give them space, who, uh, if it's not just children we're not related to, children who we might be related to, but giving them shelter. Think about Abu Talib, and we'll come back to the Prophet and how this impacted him when he returns the favor. So see the support system that the tribal system, uh, the tr tribal society had. In place. You think about that. When we think of Jahiliya, we think of all these negative things, but think about that support system this tribal society had in place. Did the pre Islamic society, family, code, ethic, and bond allow the Prophet to survive? Do we have a Prophet now in, in the sense because of that, the ethics that were there? You look at just the pure ethics of care. Was that enabled? Did that enable the Prophet to uh, live to, till this day? And so uh, we might just go a couple minutes over, but I'm going to just, uh, we're in the last couple uh, slides here, but going through that, just think about that, because we oftentimes will just say that's the, uh, that's pre-Islamic Jahiliya, they're no good, they didn't do anything good, but think about that, like think how he was enabled to survive and what, what, what that might teach us for today. And so when he was growing up in Mecca, we see someone who was a quiet kid. This is after he comes to Abu Talib, so he's eight years old, he's growing up, quiet kid. He avoided loud social gatherings. He avoided, um, you know, these things that uh, most of the kids would be playing at or uh, these loud um, kind of things that are going on. And he kept to himself and he uh, kept to himself. But now we think about him, as I mentioned, with him and, and the dynamic between him and other children. Why was he maybe keeping to himself? Why didn't he play with the kids as much? And you think about how even bullied kids get to play a little bit, but then uh, someone says something and it's just, you never want to go back there again. So you think about what might have been said to him. These aren't documented in, in, in extensive detail, but think about it. And so his uncle Abu Talib was not a very well-off person as much as his brothers or his uh, stepbrothers per se. But uh, Muhammad was at an early time put to work because of this economic uh, this e economic issue with regards to his uncle not having that much with, and having to feed so many mouths. So the Prophet ﷺ at an early age was put to work, shepherding sheep along the hills of Mecca. We come back to that connection of childhood trauma, multiple losses, and equine therapy, of animal therapy, of uh, what it takes to uh, be someone who is a shepherd. It's often glorified. We might be thinking of the Western images of Jesus in white robes and bringing these smiling sheep down a hill, but any shepherd, any person that you see who works with sheep will tell you they're dirty, they're smelly, they're difficult to deal with, and they that you have to know each of them has a unique personality. So you have to be able to bring them all together. It's not an ideal job by any means. And you have a child that is doing this, learning patience, learning solitude, learning watchfulness, because you have to watch these sheep in case a wolf or some other predator comes along, you have to protect them. You have to uh, contemplate, you have to think, you have to be able to understand each need of every single sheep. And this is an eight-year-old child, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 12 year old child that's uh, growing up with these animals and learning how to uh, not just treat his own trauma, but to become a better person, to become a human uh, in, in the fullest sense through this time. And we also see beyond that, as he's learning these values, he then begins to get involved in justice work in affairs of the community, pre-Islam, before Islam. This is before the Quran comes and tells the, uh, the believers to stand up for justice. You see that uh, in, in a few different instances, I'll just lift up here, war broke out amongst the tribes and it's called the Harb al-Hijar, the sacrilegious war. And the Quraysh got looped into it. So the tribe of the prophet got looped into it. They didn't start it, they got looped into it. And the Prophet was, compelled not directly to fight, but to go help in that war cause. So he was uh, an arrow collector. If someone shot an arrow, he would go get it, give it to an archer, that person would fight. But he was on the battlefield. There's a more significant one that came about that was called the Hilful Fadud, the pact of chivalry, the code of justice, where a foreign merchant was wronged in the, uh, in the market of Mecca. And the tribes came together and say, hey, this isn't good. Like, you know, we, we, need, we, we need to take care of our foreigners. We need to take care of the people who come to our sanctuary and seek help uh, and seek to, uh, seek to give, um, uh, seek to market and whatnot. And he 
reflected on when he took part in this pact that says, yeah, we're going to protect the rights of foreigners. We're going to protect the rights of people who are not Meccans, who are not Quraysh, who come to do business here. We're going to protect them. And he reflected on this when he was a, when uh, when Islam came and after he was a prophet. And he reflected on it, saying that I participated in that. Uh, in such and such as house. And if I had the chance, it was such a good gathering, it was such a good thing to do. If I had the chance to do it again in Islam, I would have done it again. And what does that tell us about social justice? What does it tell us about getting involved in, uh, in people we might not agree with, but things that are good for our society, things that are collective good, standing up for the oppressed. The Prophet did it in, before he was a prophet, he did it and he would say he would do it after uh, he was a prophet. And we also have the famous story of the Black Stone, how the Kaaba was, uh, by one of these extreme floods I had mentioned, had been collapsed, had been destroyed. And so rebuilding the Kaaba, not just being there to help rebuild the Kaaba, but also when there's a sacred Black Stone that uh, was wanting to be put in and a dispute broke out, people uh, we're like, hey, okay, we're just going to give it to an arbitrator. Let's see who walks in first. And the Prophet Sallam walks in first, and he devises a way for them to settle their dispute. He says, put the stone in the middle of this uh, cloth or whatnot. Each of the tribes pick up a corner, and we're going to take it, and I'll put it there. I, and he was regarded as someone who was a trustworthy, but also a just person. Uh, but he figured out solutions. He was not just like, okay, hey, stop being babies. Stop doing this. He didn't, he didn't talk uh, with regards to a tribal ethic. He said, hey, all of us can do it. So he appealed to the original tribal ethic. He didn't talk to them where they might have been here. He talked to them where their values were. Um, and so this goes with the hadith that he says that talk to people of their understanding. If he would have just said, oh, you all are silly, like, you know, the oldest person should do it or this person should do it. He didn't get involved in their politics. But he said, here's a problem. Let's ha let's here's here's how we can fix it according to your ethics. And they accepted it. They accept it. And so when you see him coming of age in his 20s, he becomes more involved with trade. He goes away from the shepherding. He becomes more involved with the trade. He also becomes a little bit more ambitious. He asks his uncle to marry his daughter, his daughter, Umehane or Fakhita, and he uh, was declined. So he was rejected. His first marriage proposal, he shoots, he shoots his shot, and it is no good. Um, so among other reasons given, it was that he was a poor prospect with regards that he didn't have much money of his own. He wasn't the doctor, the engineer, the lawyer that so many people are looking for. Um, he didn't, they, people didn't know what he was going to do with his future. He's just an associate on this caravan that just helps uh, bring things along. But near that same time, after he experienced his rejection, uh, respite came in the form of Khadija. And we'll wrap up here with Khadija here, that Khadija, a wealthy widow, who was two times widowed, not just once, two times widowed, much older than the process of them. It's ranging anywhere from five to 15 years from another clan, and she's, but she's a businesswoman. She's an independent businesswoman, one of the very few in this area who is seeking a trusted person that she can have oversee her cannons and uh, her, her caravans in areas such as Syria or any of these other trade routes. And she came across the Prophet Sallallahu who had a reputation for honesty and trustworthiness. And so uh, we see that uh, she was impressed with his work ethic. She proposed to him. She proposed to him via a friend, and uh, which at first he didn't feel qualified for, but he eventually did welcome. And what she says to him, really highlights who this person was at this time, because we don't know that much about the Prophet Sallam as much as we do after he was a prophet for logical reasons that people took interest in him when he became a prophet. But we see that uh, I love you because you're kinship to me, that you're never in the center of things. You're, all, you're not being a partisan. You don't want to be in the center. You're keeping to yourself, but your beauty of character, your truth of your, the truth of your speech and your trustworthiness is what I resonate with. And as I mentioned, Khadija, twice widowed, economically independent. She's older, but she proposed to Muhammad. She took that agency. And the, on the other side, the Prophet ﷺ was someone who was just making a living. He was just an honest worker. He didn't do anything to stand out. He, in fact, got denied his first marriage request. He was told that he wasn't that uh, elite person or a person who was a moneymaker. Um, and he didn't object to the fact that Khadija was married twice before. He, wasn't, he didn't object to the fact that Khadija, Khadija was older than him. He didn't see that, uh, you know, oh, I can get someone who's my age or whatnot. He saw the person for who they were and their, their honor. And he, he, he went forth with that. So inshallah, next time we're going to come to the marriage 
of uh, Khadija, and we're going to come to uh, Khadija uh, and the marriage of the Prophet Sallallahu just for time's sake here, uh, and we're, we'll talk a little bit more in detail, but we're going to go into the revelation that the Prophet Sallallahu uh, experienced with Khadija, uh, because there's a lot of really important things that we can emphasize, not just in the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu became a prophet during this time, but the role of Khadija. The Khadija was someone who we often will just see mentioned, footnoted here and there. She was his backbone. She was his support. And she was there for him when they, they experienced not just the loss of his parents, the loss of two children. He lo they lost children together. And so it's an Im important bond of love, an important story that the Prophet ﷺ never forgot. 20, even later when he was married to, uh, to Aisha, and uh, when Aisha said something disparagingly about Khadija, he said that he, he rebuked her. And he said that, uh, you know, Aisha, don't compare yourself to Khadija. She was there when no one else was there for me. She supported me. She uh, was there financially for me. She helped me when nobody else was there. And so we'll talk about how significant this marriage was, not just at the moment, but in terms of its, its, its connection there, inshallah. And so as we close out today, we, we, we want, we pause and we reflect here with regards to, there's always more to the story. Many of us are familiar with the stories that I've kind of shared here, but there's always more to the stories. We look at these stories and we need to look at them from different contexts than just our Sunday school books or how they're taught to us, but from the context that they come from, as well as how we now understand human psychology and sociology today, how different events impact different people. And we read that back into the Sirah and we see how much trauma went into the life of the Prophet Sallallahu how much of this went there. Uh, and we, we lift up the socioeconomic, sociopolitical significance, not just of the time, but how Islam addressed these things. So inshallah, today we conclude with, uh, with right before the, mar the, the marriage of Khadija to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And next time we're going to come to the marriage and we're going to go through uh, the marriage as well as uh, the revelation of the Prophet and the beginning of the Meccan period and, and the persecution that he would face. So Zakla Khair, I will, uh, you're, you're welcome to join us here for the session. So this is now open floor. I would like to invite you all to come to the space as you're comfortable, if you'd like to turn on your cameras, if not. Um, but just a guiding question, if you would like to start us off, what resonates with you in this part of the sirah? You're welcome to put it in the chat. You're welcome to just state it there. So uh, Jazakla for listening to me. I apologize for going a little over time, but let's, let's open it up for discussion. What resonates with you in this part of the sirah that we've talked about so far? Um, I'll start off. So I like uh, first. Awesome. Um, for me, uh, what resonated with me was the uh, highlighting about the trauma uh, as a child. And uh, this is the second time in a different context that you brought up that book, The Body Keeps the Score. And I, that's on my list. Um, you know, we're, uh, as some of you may know, we're, we, we are creating a space for some foster children. And um, so that that just keyed me in. I'm like, what, 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 to, more, what? Okay, there's a connection here. And um, so because of that, that part is resonating with me. And it's something that entirely is brushed over uh, in traditional teaching of the Sira. And, and sometimes rightfully so. When you're introduced to the Sira, you just start with simple things. He was a kid, he was an orphan, and then boom, 40 years later, he's a prophet. Ta-da! Uh, but I, I think it's something to think about more and that resonates. So thank you for that. Oh, I appreciate you mentioning that, uh, Omar, and sharing your personal connection to that. Because you you can, like I said, in, in so many ways, maybe relate to this. And especially like that, those two years, what was it like to uh, what, what, what does a child bring to the table, you know, in two years and, uh, you know, how, how, how precious those moments are, but how volatile they can be, um, not just on the child, but the caregiver as well. Um, and so I appreciate you mentioning that because it, it adds a dimension to it that not just what was the prophet going through, what were his caregivers going through? You know, this, these, were, these weren't, you know, uh, single household families. They had many children. They had so many things. How does he fit into that? How do they make him fit in to a point to where he felt welcomed and such? So I appreciate you mentioning that. Thank you. Sana, was there something you'd like to add to what connected with you in the 
Sorry. Well, I was just putting my camera on to say hi, but <laughs> um, I mean, everything, honestly, just because I'm not super familiar with the CETA. And so this was like really helpful for me. Just, I mean, I kind of knew some of the general stuff, but like, I really enjoyed listening to like the details and the specifics just because I didn't know any of that. And I think it's like so fascinating. And I'm also glad Omer brought up the whole trauma piece because, you know, obviously I'm like interested in that too. Um, and Osama, I really like that you brought up like the whole just like support system because that is really important whenever you are going through so much trauma and change as a child, like having that support system is really, really important. Yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. And it, just, it makes you just think about what, what, like for me, when I think about it, I'm like what was that support system like for the profit because it was also it was changing pretty pretty consistently and finally but it's interesting to see that it, it, it was kind of a very nomadic sense but it when it got to his uh his marriage you know that was such a you see so many things being brought in some people commentate how the prophet not just had this relationship with Khadija of a wife but Khadija being older than him was uh, someone who's uh, a, a wise person that was able to give kind of like a, uh, a, a motherly type of care and love um, that, that you may oftentimes not give to a spouse. Uh, we, and we'll get to this next time that where he got revelation the first time and he runs and he says, cover me, cover me. Um, and just like you see this fusion of this motherly love, but you see a wife as well. And just like uh, how he's supported in so many different ways, but by these people that are taking on things like Abu Talib was probably the closest thing he had to a dad um, and filling those roles and things like that. And it's just, it just makes me think about in, in our time here, how do we, uh, how, how do those look for people that we provide support for? And then maybe for us as well, do our support systems also, also change there? That's interesting that you say that because like, if you're familiar with like attachment theory, the theory states that like the attachments you make with like your caregivers that actually develops like into adult attachment to like your romantic partner. So it's interesting that you have like compared Khadija to like his mom or like having that like motherly love because it actually is related like psychologically. I'm gonna count on you to, to bring that up when we when we do our next session and we bring that up. Uh, so that, that's gonna be really interesting to, 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 to discuss because it's absolutely very real. And you know, some people will be like, oh, it's kind of weird, but it's there, but it's, there's, uh, you, you, can, you can talk about, it, especially from that intersection of, uh, of, of trauma, of just uh, a, a really odd development of, of uh, a child having to go through multiple losses and what they might be seeking uh, in, 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 you know, in adulthood and how that affects them going forward. I appreciate that. Uh, anybody else with regards to what resonates with you in this part of the Sierra? Maybe what connections do you see in the Sierra uh, and the world we live in today? Um, I hope I gave you at least some connections there, but is there any connections that you all feel like uh, come up? Dr. Constance, I see a unmute there, so I will, I'm going to call on you here. <laughs> that's all there you go. Uh, you know, I'm one sorry. thing that I thought about was how I think we underestimate what happens in a child's mind as a result of their experiences. Um, you know, we talk about the different periods in which he was orphaned, it seems, again and again. And the first thing, and I think from a from a, an adult perspective, you say, oh my, my God, I, I would think that that child would be in despair. But we, we also may, may, it may have happened that that was actually deepening his faith because he, he it, it wasn't like he became orphaned and he ended up getting thrown out and taken care of, of by mean and evil people. He was actually nurtured by most of these people and and we don't know what his prayers or thought, thoughts were when he lost his mother. Like, where do I go? What? Where's the relief I'm going to get in, in that six, six year old mind or, you know, a young mind that you have? And when and what happens as a result of being of, of then finding themselves cared by that they were actually not left alone? You know what I'm saying? The same thing that happened with Hadja, you know, that, that she was, she was put out there, but she was put out there with the knowledge and, and faith that she, that Allah was going to take care of her. So uh, I see it on the same basis of the prophet, you know, even, even though he's much younger, that he was developing faith, you know, that even though he couldn't, couldn't see it at that time, that young age he was, th there was an answer, you know, and it wasn't something that he could definitely see then, but it builds faith in you. And I think that that was, to me, uh, very prophetic in the sense of 
that was building on the faith that he had as he became uh, came as a prophet. That's, that's the way I look at it. That's a really powerful connection, uh, Dr. Constance. I mean, we're, we're definitely that's that's one thing that's very interesting. You bring it up. Uh, we're gonna uh, talk about it in the next session. That as the prophet is getting, you know, to this point, he's older. He's seeking isolation, he, but he's uh, he he comes to revelation. But that time that we we don't really talk about as much. What was that thirty? His thirty to forty year old kind of self like. Why was he going in isolation? And it's really interesting. I think Khaled uh, Abu uh, Fadl poses it like this: that he's fight, he's seeking out God. He doesn't. He's he he connects it to um, to the Muslim that is in uh, the present day that might not know God specifically, but is coming to know God and is actively searching and trust that there is something that is there. There is someone who I can find refuge with, escape with, uh, and comes to in, comes to you know uh, comes to a uh, a connection with that God. But I, I, that's such a powerful connection that you made for him and his his great great grandmother Hajar. Um, and that that uh, that almost genetic trust that tawakkul in God that exists there. I really appreciate you making that. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. May I make another statement? Uh, the other thing I, I thought about was um, how he, each of those times that he became orphan, he never. I, I don't think that we um, appreciate the um, what happens in that dynamic when you are are, are within someone's household. And you're, you're becoming part of that culture. I think this is just me, and I've heard, heard any man say this, is that, that he was an empty vessel in the sense of he was not as rooted in culture or the family dynamic, perhaps because of those experiences, which led him to be open to you know, the, the, the revelation. I, and I, I, when I heard that, that was just like chilling to me. It wasn't like he was a blank slate. But that he wasn't wedded, you know, he wasn't tied down by those 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 relationships, like maybe uh, someone other who would, who grew up in a household that you know followed that the, whatever the family lineage, the culture, and everything like that. That maybe that helped him to not be um, as resistant. Let's be, be honest about it. You know, he didn't have those resistances in terms of culture and things like that. So I thought it was a interesting perspective I had heard. That's an absolute gem. I, I'm noting that down. That's powerful. Uh, I, I had not not thought of it like that, but that completely makes sense. And it's 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 so yeah. That, that thank you for sharing that, Dr. Constance. I'm, I'm gonna have to sit with that one for a little bit. I think uh, Omar is giving a thumbs up, and he unmuted too, so he might have something to add as well. I was I was gonna ask, I, I was just gonna ask you to repeat that, but I got it. That he was basically not tied down to one family. It, it allowed him to be open um, to to yeah. I, I love that. Definitely. Thank you for mentioning that, Dr. Constance. Um, anyone else? I see you, uh, Renee. You you mentioned uh, the structure in family and community um, that you connect with, bouncing around to relatives and times of hardship, finding where you fit in, uh, and 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 yeah, co connecting that to Dr. Constance's thing, especially in a society where that is your link to survival. That is seen as the only means for uh, ascendancy, and that's the only means of, uh, of survival per se, but to, to free yourself of those shackles and to see outside of that because you're not tied down to that. Um, th 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 thank you for listing that. And yeah, we're definitely going to have to incorporate that, uh, Dr. Constance. That's pretty powerful. Uh, any, anyone else uh, with regards to uh, Moi? Yeah, I just wanted to uh add to Dr. Constance's comment by saying, uh, by, I guess, reminding everyone that if you, if, you, if you look at other prophets as well, Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, and uh, Yusuf alayhi salam, if you think about it, they were also, they didn't come from a strong family uh, unit as well. They went through similar you know, similar experiences. I mean, this is just, just what I'm pulling from my, uh, my knowledge, yeah. you know, so just, separation yeah, separation from the family, you know, just, just adding to my two cents. Oh, that's, a, that's a beautiful contribution. And it, 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 it makes me think of an added significance based on what you just said. Uh, you know, there's a hadith that the Prophet says that uh, the prophets are, are, are like brothers. Right. Or that he names some specific prophets like brothers. And you think about, oh, hey, you know, they're just they're prophets. So they're in the brotherhood of prophet. But then you think about, like you just mentioned, there's a deeper connection. Uh, Isa was born to a single mom. 
you know, Moses was, uh, you know, born to, to a mom, you know, and, and, and kind of uh, had, had to be had because of economic circumstances, because of the fear of death, uh, was, was essentially uh, raised outside of that house and, and made alien from his home. Uh, you think of uh, Yusuf, you know, taken from a young age, and you think of all these connections that it makes it, it's, it's kind of just like that point that uh, we're, we're trying to get at this that you just named is beyond what we are kind of told and beyond what we read, we read between the lines um, that's there. I think there was a, I, I'd mentioned this in another, um, in another group, but it was that a, a saying of Rumi's teacher that says, you know, you look for uh, the black text on the white page, I'm gonna look for the white between the black as a way of looking at the meaning that's, that's beyond the lines. And what, what does it mean when the prophet says that the prophets are brothers to one another? Do they have shared experiences? Do they have that? Do they have these? He, he mentions that you know all the prophets that came were also shepherds. Was there? Is there? You know, there's these connections that are there, not just like, hey, they were shepherds. Here's their mo. Here's their CV. But like, what did they do? What what work was required of them? What experiences did they have? And uh, it, it's 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 an absolutely beautiful connection. He lifted up Moeen. So I thank you for for mentioning that. I mean, back to this, I, I think that the the MO of the prophets, but they were they were seen as outsiders in a sense. In other words, they weren't just the normal people, but not abnormal in the sense that they weren't human, but they 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 moved differently, they acted differently, they may not have been accepted. Think about, about Musa. He said, Musa went when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala came to him, you know, he said, Look, I can't speak. <laughs> Can you give me somebody to help me? You know, nobody's gonna listen to me. <laughs> you know, he said, Okay, you got your brother, come on, all right. So it's, it's, it's that they were other, but not other in the sense that we like to, to, to sometimes think of someone, the prophethood, that is up some pedestal and they, you know, have some mysterious type. Of, no, they were one, one of us, but they just didn't think the way that we did. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw that and used that as a vehicle. You know what I'm saying? So they were believable and they were among us, but they were different in that they, that, that, that presence in us and we, we were able to see them and, and, and it draw, draw us, draw, drew all of us in, in our own way, like 1400 years uh, now, you know, to them in a, in a way that it was believable that these are human beings and that we could relate to the fact that they're human beings, but their character was above and beyond what we, we have, well, what we see ourselves in, but it is attainable. That's, that's the very important thing because if we, if we don't see ourselves as relatable to them, there's no way that we can change our, our behavior. I think building on what you were saying, Dr. Khan, is like maybe they're all, they're all the prophets were kind of broken in a way, whether it was Musa's speech and the stuttering or the orphanhood or the, like you said, like the outsider status. I like that. And, and that's okay to be different. <laughs> maybe they yeah. can't them out of trouble. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? No, Sam, uh, I was bullied a lot as a kid, you know, and we moved around from place to place. And um, when you mentioned that maybe he was kind of melancholy or an outsider, because maybe he was bullied, the prophet, you know, hey, man, you're an orphan. <laughs> you're not from anyone. You got no dad. Get out of here. Um, that that resonates with me a lot. Being a kid who was bullied a lot. So I'm going to I'm going to Say he was, because then that's my connection. <laughs> no, I, I can agree. I was I was a bully child too. And I I say to the day, alhamdulillah, I think that kept me out of spaces that I didn't need to be in the first place. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's, true. that's why that's right. I, I, I wasn't allowed in. I wasn't a cool kid. <laughs> Yeah, no, you, you, you brought up a real direct connection there. Like, you know, you, I think a lot, if it may not be explicitly mentioned, you can kind of infer that, you know, when, when the prophet being questioned, like, you know, this person's like a prophet, why wouldn't they get somebody with a, the, a perfect lineage? Why wouldn't they get somebody like this? You can imagine his, those people that are his peers now, what were they saying to him when he was a kid? Uh, but, but yeah, just, just like you had kind of mentioned there that, um, you know, a, a, apart from that, uh, you know, what, what all um, might, might not be, might, might be going through his mind, but also what are, what are we kind of connecting with there? The fact that, hey, he, he, he did, um, he did get, get bullied in a sense, but also, uh, you know, what, what, what was kind of, what was going through his mind? And like, when I look at the process, um, I don't think, I think about, and I've traditionally grown up seeing the prophet as this kind of like paragon and 
uh, someone who's this perfect exemplar, perfect morals, uh, absolutely, all, all that is warranted. But it's like when a kid's getting bullied, how often are we said, hey, the Prophet Sallam also like, he was like bullied for maybe similar reasons, or maybe it was called like that. Like how often is, is that connection made uh, where it's just like, hey, you know, don't, don't be bullied. We, don't, we keep faith separate from there. Uh, and it's just, it's just so interesting to me that uh, when, when we look at the prophet as an example, it doesn't say in the, in the, in the Quran that he's a perfect man. He's a perfect person for, uh, for men to look up to or a perfect person for this demographic. It's a perfect example for anyone who believes, for anyone who, uh, who submits or anyone that's there regardless of their, uh, their difference or their gender there. And so, uh, yeah, no, I appreciate you lifting that up, Omar. I think that there's, uh, th these are just kind of like those little gems that are, that are coming out as we start to see the prophet, not just as that 570 AD to 632 historical figure that came with uh, a religion and did, did so and so or whatnot, but as a person that we can, uh, as we can kind of resonate with. I think one thing that uh, someone had mentioned to me was there was a hadith of the process of that the believer is like the mirror of the other believer, um, that they're a reflection of that believer. Um, and, and sometimes being able to see the Prophet ﷺ at least uh, in the in in our lives or whatnot, uh, seeing that example in certain parts, like hey, I might not be to that level or whatever it may be, but we have a connection in uh, if if my faith is not accepted of me, if I'm like orphaned, if I'm all these different things, and being willing to take those connections, because I think that helps foster that that love that's there. So I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, Salam alaikum. This is Moin's other half, just piping in. Um, I have two questions. One is that, you know, today was our first class and just as, as we go through each, uh, each week, is there a, uh, anything we could, I, I saw this, there's a syllabus, but I haven't dived into it real deep. Is there stuff we could be doing to prepare ahead of each course or, or each class? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and a couple other folks have asked this as well. Um, so uh, what I can do is I, I don't expect anyone to come with anything prepared. I just kept things generic. But if it's helpful for folks, um, uh, like I, I can identify some specific areas like those. When you look on the syllabus, it has like the different topics that we're covering. I'm happy to reference uh, like I, I, I there's a I don't know if all the books are available specifically online or whatnot, but there is, for example, the biography of the prophet that's by Martin Lings. There's a PDF of it that I can link there and I can put the page numbers that where we are in the story. So you can at least see the story as it plays out. Um, and what I'll do as well is the, the, the discussion questions are going to kind of center on this. We might add some more as well, but we're focusing on the connection aspect. So when you read the story, it might be helpful just to see those connections, but I'll, I'll do that for you um, and for everybody here, uh, just so everybody can reference in case we're on a different page or whatnot, uh, you, the, at least the bare aspect of what story are we talking about? What pages are we even on? Um, and that way we can kind of go through that. Would, would that be something, at least a helpful reference? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely do don't want to create more work for you or for us. <laughs> Frankly, I'm not, I'm fine with just showing up, but I kind of felt because I haven't really done a thorough research or reading of this era, I feel like it might benefit me. And then also I'm sure there's be, there will be weeks when I miss a class. So it might be helpful to catch up on just the reading. And then my second question is um, for Omar, actually, I was just very curious about what it is that you're eating. <laughs> so it's a scare it's a scare oh, thank you that, that answers <laughs> thank you i was chewing gum i was just noticing you were drinking from a cup and then chewing so that made me very intrigued i i yeah i have this habit of just going through a pack of gum within like 30 minutes and then drinking i don't know why yeah <laughs> It's uh, a thank, thank you for killing my curiosity. <laughs> Definitely, no. Thank you for thank you for asking that question, Sally. I think we might have all been looking at Omar and being like, "What is coming out of that cup?" But I appreciate you getting to the bottom of that mystery. Um, but yeah, no. Sana Sana mentioned that. Yeah, uh, it's it's not a, it's not a hard deal. Like, luckily, when you look at that biography of of uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
by Martin Lings. It's a very easy read through. Um, and each chapter is like a segment of his life. So it's like two or three pages. Literally each of these things is two or three pages. So you can, you can catch up to where we are within the first like 15 or 20 minutes. It's not a very hard read or anything. So I'll list the pages on there for each time and with the, with the link that you all can access those. Um, so I will definitely do that uh, as we're at time here. Anybody have any final questions, comments, or anything that you'd like to part with as we uh, uh, stop for today, but and shall we pause the conversation and continue it next time. So anything else that might be on y'all's hearts or minds for the session. Okay, I several years, well, longer than that. Uh, my late husband and I may have, I'll be pleased with him. Uh, we, we started um, kind of like a journal and the journal was, we thought we were gonna make it into a book called uh, WWPMD, what would Prophet Muhammad do? And so what we were trying to do was take uh, common day issues and and try to imagine you're know, using the Quran and the Seer of the Prophet and the Hadith. How would what would Prophet Muhammad say about certain situations? Anyway, I'm just throwing this out there. I would like to suggest that we look at a, a, a modern day issue. And make some comments what we think would come from an Islamic perspective for how the prophet would do it. I'll give you an example. We just had a bombing, all these bombings, you know, in, in the Middle East, and what went on several weeks ago. What would the prophet say about that? I like that a lot, Dr. Constance. And I, I think that that keeps us all as well um, aware of what's going on. And I, I, I'll, I'll definitely incorporate that for uh, a discussion session question that we can open up with or so next time connecting to a real world event and you you all are welcome to bring it as well these like i said this is just these questions i have here are just something i'm going off of you are welcome to uh drop them in the chat or whatnot like hey can we start off with this uh, i really like that because i think that's the direction that we are going in is not just connecting it to ourselves but the world around us when i see something on the news having that mentality of not just like oh islam will fix this this is this like why aren't these things but like what would the prophet do, you know, in the face of, you know, uh, uh, migration of refugees coming across the border? What would the prophet do? You know, what, what, like putting that persona there. And I really, really appreciate you mentioning that. We'll definitely uh, incorporate that there. Thank you. Um, any, anyone else? Uh, any final things uh, before we part today? Um, yeah, uh, the message is a, it's a, it's absolute, absolute classic. Um, I, 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 I think everybody who watches it enjoys it. Uh, it's a good, good watch there. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, uh, Usama, I, and um, everyone else. This is Fatma. I um, will be joining by phone um, for the rest of the series. Um, I want to thank you very much. I did take a lot of notes on what you said, brother. You've done a great job of filling out some of the blanks that I've had. Um, like, I did not know that he actually, um, that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, uh, you know, proposed to somebody else and, and that didn't happen. Um, I suppose for me as somebody who's, you know, kind of uh, from the psycho psychology and critical race theory type of person, I hate being that person, but I'm always thinking about how many things we have steered off course and how this narrative has been co-opted by so many uh, other dominant Muslims with more money and more beards. And it's just really disheartening sometimes to think about uh, having, well, I'm thankful for this space, but I go to the average masjid, it's not like that at all. <laughs> like the, the things we are promised in the Quran um, and from the Sirat, it's not always seen. And so, you know, having to be that person all the time, it's, it's really difficult. So I am thankful for a community of sorts um, that allows us to have that reminder that there are people who are up to today doing that kind of good work. And even if we face a lot of trials, um, we don't need to um, lose heart or forget that Allah SWT is with us, even if we're not prophets. Um, you know, because sometimes people always try to make us try to make me feel better by saying, well, you know, prophets went through this and women went, you know, people who are very close to prophets went through this. But for me, it's like, well, I'm just a regular person. And, you know, other people might say, well, you obviously are a different kind of person, but, you know, I, I'm always wrestling with these kinds of things. So again, thank you for centering it and reminding us um, that these stories are still relevant um, today. And 
um, there are people of all generations and all backgrounds who could derive really good um, lessons from the the stories of yesterday because sometimes we lose that that thread of remembering that a lot of these same stories we can learn from we're not just alone you know born this you know in this time and then forget about all the things that were um learned before or taught before there are there are valuable lessons in past generations that we can remember um like for me i take a lot of strength from family and ancestral stories and you know that's another thing that i guess you know, upon reflection he might not have had as much of um but i take a lot of strength from that um and so I, again just thank you very much and i look forward to next week inshallah Inshallah, thank you so much for for that, Fatima. I'm, 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 I hope that we stay in the path where I'm maybe the bearded brother. I don't have a lot of money, but we'll, we'll <laughs> in a good in a good life. I hear you. <laughs> Definitely, but no, thank you so much for joining. Thank you everybody else uh, for joining. Um, you're welcome to send any feedback or so. Please do join the WhatsApp group uh, if you do uh, have a chance. Um, uh, the link was sent out. I can send it again, but you can email me if you have any questions. But I hope to see you all, Inshallah, next. Uh, week and we can we can go from there but take care thank you for staying along and we're just starting this journey out so y'all stay blessed all right salam alaikum alaikum salam alaikum salam